Arguing in the affirmative is Randall Rouser, an associate professor of historical theology at Taylor Seminary in Edmonton, Canada, where he teaches in the areas of theology, church history, apologetics, and worldview. He has written several books, including Theology in Search of Foundations, Oxford, 2009, The Swedish Atheist, The Scuba Diver and Other Apologetic Rabbit Trails, InterVarsity, 2012, and a collection of debates with atheist John Loftus, called God or Godless, Baker, 2013. Randall keeps a blog at randallrouser.com and is married with one daughter. He also has two small fuzzy dogs and isn't ashamed to be seen walking them in the neighborhood. And in the negative, we have Jonathan Pierce, a teacher, philosopher, blogger, and author, who has also written several books, including Free Will, an investigation into whether we have free will or whether I was always going to write this book, and The Little Book of Unholy Questions, which is a cumulative case against God. And most relevant to today's episode, his latest book, The Nativity, A Critical Examination, which is a collection of arguments against the historicity of the nativity accounts. Pierce is one of the founding authors for the Skeptical Inc. Network, and his blog, titled The Tippling Philosopher, can be found at skepticinc.com forward slash tippling. Jonathan lives with his partner and twin toddler boys, and yes, he has written a book on that too, Twins, A Survival Guide for Dads. This debate is not a live debate. This debate was a lengthy series of exchanges between our guests in the form of carefully scripted and recorded audio clips to a specified length over the course of several weeks. This puts emphasis on the arguments rather than on one's ability to think on their feet. So Reasonable Doubts wants to thank both of these gentlemen for the effort they put forth in this lively debate, and uh, listeners can feel free to comment on our blog or the blogs of our guests with any helpful comments, criticisms, or questions. So without further delay, here is the debate. First off, I would like to extend thanks to Jonathan Pierce for inviting me to participate in this debate and to the Reasonable Doubts podcast for hosting it. Our topic is whether the nativity accounts of Matthew 1 and 2 and Luke 1 and 2 are historically reliable. For ease of reference, I will refer to these narratives henceforth as M and L. For my case, defending the historical reliability of M and L means defending the reasonableness of belief in certain historical claims based on the testimony of M and L. However, I will not be concerned to defend every historical claim in M and L, nor is this my obligation, since one can consistently maintain that a historical account is reliable in its central claims, even if one has doubts about its reliability in its secondary claims. Consequently, my focus will be on defending reasonable belief in three specific claims which are found in both M and L, and which have a clear primacy in each narrative. They are as follows. 1. The birth of Jesus was the result of a miraculous virgin conception. 2. Jesus' biological mother was Mary, and his legal father was Joseph. 3. Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Note that I am not arguing that no reasonable person could doubt these three claims. Such a thesis would be far too strong. My argument is only that a person could reasonably believe the three claims based upon the witness of M and L. In other words, I am not arguing for Christian faith so much as I am defending the reasonableness of belief in the three claims as they occur in M and L. While it is worthwhile for a Christian to reflect on M and L and the historical evidence they provide for the virginal conception of Jesus, we should keep this question in context. To that end, I will make two points briefly. First, while the virgin conception is an important Christian doctrine, assent to it is not essential to Christian identity. In that respect, it is quite different from the doctrines of the Trinity incarnation, and atonement, which are essential. Consequently, it is possible to be a Christian and reject the virgin conception as two leading theologians of the 20th century, Emil Brunner and Wolfhard Pannenberg, both did. Second, it is possible to assent rationally to the virgin conception while believing that M&L do not provide a reliable historical witness to it. <clears throat> 
This was essentially the view taken by New Testament scholar Raymond Brown in his magisterial volume, The Birth of the Messiah. In contrast to theologians like Bruner and Ponenberg, I do accept the virgin conception. And in contrast to Brown, I do, I do accept M and L as reliable historical witnesses to the three claims. Consequently, I will be defending that position in this debate. But keep in mind that other options for the Christian do exist. The truth of Christianity is not at stake in this debate. With those caveats in mind, we can now turn to my argument for the reasonableness of belief in the three primary claims based on the historical witness of M and L. My argument consists of four premises and a conclusion. Premise 1. It is reasonable for one to believe historical claims that are recorded in two or more independent prima facie credible sources based on the witness of those sources, unless one has good reasons to reject those claims. Premise 2. The three claims are historical claims that are recorded in two independent sources, M and L. 3. M and L are prima facie credible sources. 4. Christians have no good reasons to reject M and L. 5. Therefore, it is reasonable for Christians to accept the three claims that are recorded in M and L based on the witness of M and L. In the remainder of my opening statement, I will devote time to explicating and defending each of these four premises. So let's begin. Premise 1. It is reasonable for one to believe historical claims that are recorded in two or more independent prima facie credible sources based on the witness of those sources unless one has good reasons to re- to reject those claims. Now here's a question. Why should we assent to claims that are recorded in more than one independent prima facie credible source? At this point, we are depending on the historiographical principle of multiple attestation, according to which claims that are repeated in more than one source have a higher historical credibility than those that are not. Distinguished New Testament scholar Graham Twelftree explains that, quote, multiple attestation in independent sources demonstrates that a scene did not originate with the texts that contain it, unquote. Thus, if M and L constitute separate sources, then we know that any historical claims in both did not originate in M or L, but rather predate both documents. Premise 2. The three claims are historical claims that are recorded in two independent sources, M and L. It might seem obvious that the three claims are intended as historical claims. However, a person could argue that one or more of these claims is included for non-historical purposes. For example, it could be argued they are meant as midrash, a form of theological commentary. Arguably, other details in the in MNL do have this function. For example, the roles of Elizabeth, Mary, and Anna as prophetic roles in L anticipate Jesus' fulfillment of prophet in the gospel. And the confrontation in M between King Herod and baby Jesus prefigures Jesus' confrontation with the political powers at the end of his life. One could interpret these details as theological proleptic anticipations which link the the core narrative with the later birth narrative of Jesus. But even if that is the case, or possibly the case, in some of these secondary claims, it is clear that the three claims we are defending are intended as historical, since they figure later on in the historical narratives of Matthew and Luke. As far as the source independence of math of M and L, this is clearly illustrated in the wide divergence of these two narratives. For example, M includes Magi, King Herod, and a special focus on Joseph, while L includes shepherds, the census of Quirinius, and a special focus on Mary. You might think that establishing M and L as independent sources is a double-edged sword. 
because it draws attention to the significant differences between them. But consider two biographies of Abraham Lincoln, Doris Kern Goodwin's Team of Rivals, and David Herbert Donald's book Lincoln. In her book, Goodwin seeks to establish Lincoln's adeptness as a politician in the final months of his career. Meanwhile, Donald places significant focus on Lincoln's early years, with approximately half the biography focused on the period before 1861. The many contrasts, and even occasional contradictions, between these two biographies do not discredit their overarching central claims. Matthew and Luke also have different purposes. For example, Matthew is traditionally believed to have been written for a Jewish audience, while Luke's audience is traditionally considered to be primarily Gentile. While Matthew is anxious to show how Jesus fulfills Old Testament prophecies and expectations, Luke picks up the theme of God's liberation of the poor and oppressed coming through Jesus. None of these differences present any problem to the historical witness of these documents to the three claims. Premise 3 M and L are prima facie credible sources. An argument for the credibility of M and L begins with a defense of the credibility of the Gospels in which they occur. The first reference outside the New Testament to four Gospels comes in the writing of Papias, the Bishop of Heropolis, which dates to around A.D. 95. Papias notes that there are four Gospels of the, in, circulating in the Church at the time, that of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Given that we have no evidence of other documents from the ancient church that were identified with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we have excellent reason to believe that the Gospels to which Papias refers are the same as the four Gospels we have in the New Testament. In sum, we have good reason to believe that by the end of the first century, a collection of four Gospels attributed to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John was being circulated in the church. But can we reasonably believe that Matthew and Luke authored their Gospels, given the widespread practice of pseudopigraphy, the attribution of false authorship, in the ancient world? Indeed, we can. Consider an example. If you are going to forge a signature on baseball memorabilia in order to sell it, you will likely forge the name of a star like Babe Ruth or Hank Aaron. Few people would bother to forge an obscure player few had ever heard of. Likewise, any first century Christian author intent on attributing his work to a false author to gain it greater credibility would choose a respected person within the community, one with recognized authority like Peter, James, or John. They would not choose an obscure former tax collector or a little-known Gentile doctor. Thus, the relative obscurity of Matthew and Luke in the early church grants credibility to the Matthean and Lucan claims of authorship. Much of modern scholarship has been enamored of the assumptions of form criticism, according to which stories of Jesus circulated for an extended period in an oral culture before they were finally written down. In his magisterial volume, Jesus and the Eyewitnesses, Richard Bauckham takes direct aim at this assumption by arguing that we have excellent grounds to trust the Gospels as historical accounts based on eyewitness testimony to the events described. Bauckham writes that the Gospels, quote, embody the testimony of the eyewitnesses, not, of course, without editing and interpretation, but in a way that is substantially faithful to how the eyewitnesses themselves told it, since the evangelists were in more or less direct contact with eyewitnesses, unquote. Bauckham's case provides an excellent argument to trust the Gospels as based and rooted in eyewitness testimony. But what about M and L specifically? Since Matthew and Luke obviously were not around for the nativity, on which eyewitness sources might they have depended to drop these nativity narratives? According to the early church, Matthew derived his nativity information from an interview with Joseph, Joseph 
while Luke derived his from an interview with Mary. Is this plausible? Indeed it is. Given that it is plausible that the Gospels of Matthew and Luke were authored by Matthew and Luke, and it is plausible that their Gospels are based on eyewitness testimony, it is also plausible that the three facts of M and L are based ultimately on the eyewitness testimony of Joseph and Mary. The antiquity of M and L is supported by close textual analysis of the documents themselves. Consider, for example, the use of Hebrew parallelism within the narratives. Consider as well the pre-Pauline theological perspectives of the narratives. As J. Gresham Machen observes, quote, There is certainly no hint of any sharp Pauline distinction between righteousness under the law and the righteousness that comes through faith, unquote. These documents, M and L, also present a worldview that appears to be clearly pre-70 A.D. To give an example, Machen points out that the description of Simeon awaiting the consolation of Israel and the group to which Anna speaks awaiting the redemption of Israel both reflect an optimism that is indicative of Jerusalem prior to the devastating fall to the Romans in A.D. 70. Many internal details, theological, uh, cultural, and in terms of worldview, are indicative of an early Palestinian origin for these testimonies. One final consideration for m l links their credibility back to the wider Gospels in which they are embedded. Both Matthew and Luke are framed by two miraculous claims, namely the virginal conception and the resurrection. It stands to reason, then, that if we have historical grounds to believe one of these miracles occurred, we have stronger historical grounds to believe the other one did as well. And indeed, there are excellent historical grounds to believe in the resurrection based on the empty tomb and post-resurrection appearances of Jesus as recorded in extremely early sources, especially the formula quoted by Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3 and following, which dates to about the year A.D. 51. But if we have reason to believe that Jesus was resurrected, then we also have good reason to defer to prima facie credible claims that he was virginally conceived as well. Premise 4. Christians have no good reasons to reject M and L. We begin the defense of premise 4 by noting that it is specified to Christians. The reason for this is simple. The credibility you are willing to grant various truth claims depends on a background plausibility framework. If, for example, you are persuaded that there probably is no God, then you will have a very high degree of skepticism toward claims to God's action in history. By contrast, if you are persuaded that there is a God, or probably is a God, then you will be much more open to claims of, to God's action in history. Consequently, premise 4 establishes that there are no good defeaters to the historical witness of M and L to the three claims, for those who are already open to the truth of those claims. Of course, many critics believe that there are good reasons to reject M and L. I disagree, and to make my point, I'll take a moment to briefly refute two of those alleged good reasons. The first alleged good reason is the claim that M and L should be rejected because they have an ideological case to make, or a theological axe to grind, namely, to persuade their readers of the messiahship of Jesus. Well, of course this is true. M and L are written with that purpose in mind. But that doesn't discredit them. As renowned historian Howard Zinn once observed, quote, All history, while recalling the past, serves some present interest, unquote. Whether that interest is economic or political, social or theological, is quite irrelevant. All historians relay accounts of the past in order to shape the present. Consequently, any person who objects to the gospel writers because they do this, that person simply reflects a personal ignorance of history and how it works. This brings us to a second failed objection. 
the second failed objection points out that allegedly the motif of God being born has precursors in pagan Greek thought and that the motif of a miraculous birth has precursors in Jewish thought. Well, that's true enough. But from this, the objector concludes that the virgin conception claim in m l somehow arose from these sources. The problem with such claims is that they are wholly circumstantial and speculative. No link has been established. Hume once pointed out that constant conjunction does not entail causal connection, nor, we might add, does mythical precursor entail causal connection. It is now time to summarize our case. I began by establishing the value of multiple attestation in independent prima facie credible sources. Next, I pointed out that M and L provide independent sources to our three historical claims. From there, I argued that M and L are both credible based on considerations internal to their narrative, as well as to the Gospels in which each occurs. Finally, I noted that there are no good objections to the basic historical veracity of M and L. This brings us finally to our conclusion, premise 5. Therefore, it is reasonable for Christians to accept the three claims that are recorded in M and L based on the witness of M and L. And that means that it is reasonable for a Christian to believe in the historical witness of M and L, that Jesus was born in Bethlehem, that his biological mother was Mary, and that his legal father was Joseph and that he was born of a miraculous virgin conception. And in that sense, we can defend indeed the historical reliability of the nativity accounts of Matthew 1-2 and Luke 1-2. and Thank you very much to Justin Sheber for setting up this debate, and equally to Randall Rouser for agreeing to take part with me in discussing the question, are the nativity accounts historically reliable? I will be arguing that the accounts are not, indeed, historically reliable, and in order to establish my position, I will do three things. Firstly, I will analyse what the characteristics of something that is accepted as being historically reliable usually look like. Secondly, I will measure the two Gospel accounts up against such criteria. And thirdly, I will look at the accounts themselves and the claims that they make, evaluating them for historical coherence. Before I start on a historical method and procedures, let me take a mainstream view uh, on the Gospels of Luke and Matthew. They were written by unknown authors in unknown times and unknown places and with unknown sources. So already things look a little precarious. We can have educated guesses at the time and the place and uh, different theories on what we, we may think are the answers to these problems, say, for example, written in the late 1st century in Syria and Greece, but we can't be sure um, of these claims. So what are the hallmarks of something which can reliably be said to be historically accurate? If we take the genre of historical writing, here is a list of source criticism procedures and core principles, and how the two gospel accounts measure up against them. The evaluation of sources uh, used by um, historical accounts, or the historical accounts themselves as sources, um, how we evaluate them for their reliability. So the first point... Human sources may be relics such as fingerprints or narratives such as a statement or a letter. Relics are more credible sources than narratives. In the, account, in the situation of the Gospel accounts, uh, the sources are narratives, uh, narratives by evangelists. Point two, any given source may be forged or corrupted. Strong indications of the originality of the source increase its reliability. Now, in the case of the Gospels, the sources may well have been redacted with interpolations. We, uh, there are theories um, that are bound about the interpolations within the Gospels, and we can't be 100% sure. Point number three. 
The closer a source is to the event which it purports to describe, the more one can trust it to give an accurate historical description of what actually happened. In the case of the Gospels, they were written some nine decades after the event. So after the birth of Jesus, these accounts were written 90 odd years later. And this obviously must have some effect on the historical reliability. Point number four. A primary source is more reliable than a secondary source, which is more reliable than a tertiary source, and so on. The primary source being a source which is um, an eyewitness account, so someone that was actually there and saw it. A secondary source is one which um, recounts the, a, a primary source or has access to that primary source. Uh, and a tertiary source, again, is one step removed from that. As far as the um, Gospels are concerned, they are non-eyewitness, non-contemporary sources. They are at least secondary. In that 90 years, it's highly unlikely that they had access to um, any eyewitnesses. Point number five. Eyewitnesses are, in general, to be preferred. Now, this is a, quite a big problem here for the Gospels because um, we are unsure of what the sources are to the Gospels. We know that the Gospel writers were not eyewitnesses. So already the Gospels fall down on, on this point. The best the apologists can do is appeal to the uh, unknown. Well, the original sources from whom the story originally emanated could have been eyewitnesses. Sure, they could, could have been, but equally they might not have been. We just don't know. Given that, that 90 year time frame, it's unlikely that, obviously, as mentioned, the authors had access to eyewitnesses of the accounts of the events being recounted. Point number six. If a number of independent sources contain the same message, the credibility of the message is strongly increased. Big problems here because there is absolutely no independent attestation of these particular claims in Luke and Matthew um, outside of the Bible and in fact within these two accounts the claims do not uh, cohere so for example Luke's census Matthew's star and Matthew's massacre of the innocents are the only such claims both within the Bible so Luke's census is not in Matthew Matthew's star is not in Luke and outside of the Bible the two Gospels also disagree on an awful lot, as we shall see, and this is pretty terminal, in my opinion, for the historical reliability of the Gospels. For example, Luke has Joseph and family returning to Nazareth via the temple after the birth, and Matthew has them being chased to Egypt, where they stay for a few years. The fact that they disagree so fundamentally calls at least one, and probably both accounts, seriously into question. When two sources disagree and there is no other means of evaluation, then historians take the source which seems to accord best with common sense. And the problem here is that, of course, both accounts are recounting miraculous and incredible um, events, so we can't appeal to common sense. In fact, both of them defy common sense. Um, when two sources disagree on a particular point, as these two sources do, the historian will prefer the source with most authority. That is a source created by the expert or by the eyewitness. Of course, the Gospels are not eyewitness testimony, and we have no way of knowing who the sources were for the accounts, let alone whether they themselves were eyewitnesses. So it's impossible to decipher which account would have authority. We literally couldn't put Luke above... Matthew or Matthew above Luke as far as having more authority uh, and being more historically reliable. Moving on to point seven. The source whose account can be confirmed by reference to outside authorities in some of its parts can be trusted in its entirety if it's impossible similarly to confirm the entire text. That means that if we can verify that maybe a couple of claims in Luke are true but we can't verify the rest of Luke, we can be fairly safe in assuming maybe that the rest of Luke is true based on those few verifiable facts. The problem is here, of course, that there are no actions of people within Luke and Matthew that are verified outside of Luke and Matthew. 
Um, we have scant reference to anything that could be verifiable. We have the census of Quirinius, which, of course, is merely um, referring to an outside event, uh, outside of the gospel context. So that's like um, Arthur Conan Doyle in Sherlock Holmes mentioning Queen Victoria being on the throne at the time. Um, Matthew, on the other hand, refers to Herod doing something. Now, interestingly, this is one of those few instances which could be verified, but is not verified. The massacre of the innocents and what Herod does is simply not attested to at all outside of the gospel accounts. So on this particular point, there are no instances which are verified, which means that we can't then rely on those few instances to verify the rest of the accounts. There literally is absolutely nothing. And by nothing, I mean Jesus and family, the shepherds, the magi, Herod's actions. None of these people's actions are attested anywhere else at all. Point number eight. The tendency of a source is its motivation for providing some kind of bias. Tendencies should be minimised or supplemented with opposite motivations. Again, this is a huge problem for the Gospels because they tend towards a massive bias that Jesus was a Messiah. They are ex post facto. This means that the writers had vested beliefs and interests in Jesus, beliefs that without knowing him, Jesus was God. They then take it upon themselves to write a recount of his birth, thus biasing their potential objectivity. So, on to point nine, which is a follow-on from the last point. If it can be demonstrated that the witness or source has no direct interest in creating bias, then the credibility of the message is increased. Of course, this is clearly not the case with the Gospels. They are written, all four of them, by uh, people with clear agendas to evangelise. So, the Gospels fail on this point too. So... We can see that with every one of these nine aspects of source criticism, of the core principles of source analysis, the Gospels fail. We have evaluated aspects of historical reliability very quickly and found the Gospels wanting on pretty much every point. Of course, the authors do not do anything that you would expect of historians today. As Richard Carrier says in Not the Impossible Faith, page 163, and bearing in mind Luke is supposedly a much better historian than Matthew, Quote, Moreover, Luke cannot be classed with the best historians of his day because he never engages discussions of sources and methods, whereas they did. And that is a major reason why modern historians hold such men as Thucydides and Polybius and Arian in high esteem. They often discuss where they get their information, how they got their information and what they did with it. It is their open and candid awareness of the problems posed by writing a critical history that marks them as especially competent. Even lesser historians, like Xenophon, Plutarch and Suetonius, occasionally mention or discuss their sources or acknowledge the existence of conflicting accounts. End quote. Of course, neither Luke nor Matthew do any of this. They do not discuss their sources. They don't reference them. They don't give the other side of the story. There's n absolutely no mention of of the sort, sort of um, methodology or the the evaluation of sources that you'd expect from competent historians. Which And these historians did exist at the, at the time. Simply put, of course, they were not historians. So what are the internal problems with the two accounts? Well, I'll round up some of the major issues quickly. We can perhaps concentrate on some of the others in further sections. And Matthew. Firstly, we have only two Gospels covering the simply staggering claims involving important people from the East, the king himself, the death of a number of innocent children, a flight to a foreign country, and so on. Only two of the Gospels deem this as important enough to recount. Now, this is suspect in and of itself, and is more likely to support the thesis of historical inaccuracy than it is to support the thesis of historical reliability. 
Of course, I could talk at length about the miraculous birth and the fact that contemporaneous mythology as well as history, for example, Julius Caesar and Caesar Augustus, is littered with miraculous births. The claims in the Bible are not attested outside the Bible. So based on the prior probability of the myriad of other real and mythological figures having reported mythological births, which are deemed historically inaccurate, we can assume that the probability of these accounts being true is very low. There is contradiction between the ge genealogies. These are historical claims, it appears. Either the genealogy was 77 generations long, or it was 28. Both cannot be true. There is contradiction between the genealogies. These are historical claims, it appears. Either the genealogy was 77 generations long, or 28. Both cannot be true. Apologists will ad hoc reason this away, such as Luke being a matrilineal genealogy tracing uh, through Mary. But since Luke does not claim this at all and actually clearly implies a paternal genealogy is being recorded, and since there is no other evidence for a maternal genealogy in biblical or Jewish records, then the probability for this is infinitesimal. There are inconsistencies between the two list lists, irrespective of length. Now, a next issue regarding historical reliability is another contradiction. Luke has a family living in Nazareth before the birth and moving to Bethlehem. Matthew, on the other hand, has them living in Bethlehem. Matthew 1, 18 to 20 states, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. He then continues to recount the birth in Bethlehem. From here, they are chased away by Herod to Egypt, where they hang out for a few years, to return for the first time to Nazareth. Matthew 2.22 states, Then after being warned by God in a dream, he left for the regions of Galilee and came and lived in a city called Nazareth. Now this clearly implies they had never lived there before, contradicting what Luke has said. After all, Luke declared that the family returned straight to Nazareth from Bethlehem after the birth via the temple. Using the phrase, quote, when eight days had passed, end quote, and when the days for the pur purification according to the law of Moses were completed, they brought him up to Jerusalem, end quote. After this, Luke states, quote, when they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned to their own city of Nazareth, end quote. This is explicit use of temporal connectives that in no ad hoc harmonization could even remotely allow for a two year sojourn in Egypt being chased away by the murdering king. When this happens, this happened. When I went on holiday, I visited the Parthenon. I didn't do it two years later. I didn't go on six holidays between that and then visit it. It is a clear connection between the use of when and the event being claimed. The accounts couldn't be more explicitly different here. And again, at least one of them must be wrong. Of course, the biggest problem for ideals of historical reliability come when one tries to make the sense of the census. Luke's census is clearly not coherent with the reign of Herod in Matthew. Remember, neither of the accounts refers to the other subject. Luke does not even remotely refer to Herod or the Magi, and Matthew pays no heed to the census. This is a huge problem in and of itself. That aside, apologists spend an awful lot of creative time and energy trying to integrate the two claims, rather like getting two cars the car of Matthew and the car of Luke, and driving them into each other at full pelt, smashing the cars together, smashing them together to try and make one individual car. It just doesn't work. 
This is one of those fantastic moments in the Bible where we can actually attempt to verify claims because we have extra biblical sources to cross-reference. We have good reason to think that Herod died in 4 BCE, or possibly even 5 BC, and we have good reason to think that the census of Quirinius took place in 6 CE. Given that Herod didn't die right at the moment of chasing Joseph and family, we can assume that the Lucan narrative possibly took place a couple of years before Herod died. After all, he claims they waited in Egypt until he died and his son took over. That means there is an anomalous gap of at least 10 years. These two events could not have happened at the same time. Apologists do come up with weird and wonderful theories as to how this could be, but none of them cut the mustard. We know that Matthew definitely claimed Herod was alive at the time of the birth. We also know from Josephus when Herod died. Some apologists question Jewish Jewish historian Josephus, however. But he was pretty good with his dates, and this smacks of special pleading. We can also use Roman historian Cassius Dio and the coin record to know that his son Herod Archelaus ruled for 10 years stopping in 6 CE, which would confirm that Herod the Great died when Josephus claimed he did. This would place Herod the Great's death in the presumed Josephian time time frame, and it also makes sense of the Lucan census. A Roman census would not take place in a client kingdom, Judea. At the time of Herod the Great and his son was a client kingdom, meaning they were not taxed as an official Roman legislative territory and had autonomy to do much more as it liked. Uh, They had to pay an agreed annual tax, but no client kingdom has ever been given a Roman census, according to records. We know Archelaus was deposed and Roman rule reinstated over the region, and this would be exactly why the region would be given a census, to assess it for tax purposes after it comes back into Roman rule. We know when Quirinius became governor, according to records, and Luke attaches a census to him. So the 10-year gap not only remains, but it is defended by the support for the claims of each author. The only way to make sense of it is by discounting either one or both accounts. There must be historical inaccuracy. What to say, but let me stop here and sum up. One... The Gospels fail to measure up to the expected criteria for assessing historical reliability, both on source analysis and methodology. Point two, the Gospels fail to make historical coherency, both on their own and when pitted against each other. They simply cannot be reasonably harmonised into one sensible account. Something must go. Thank you, and I will be continuing to point out further inaccuracies between the two accounts later on in the debate. In his opening statement, Jonathan says he will focus on three things. First, he will consider the characteristics of historically reliable texts. Second, he will measure the gospel accounts against those criteria. And third, he will critique the overall coherence of the gospel accounts. I will focus my comments in rebuttal on the first two points, which are encapsulated in Jonathan's presentation in nine historiographical principles. In response, I will demonstrate first that the formulations Jonathan provides for several of those principles are, in fact, erroneous. Second, I will argue that those formulations appear to be ad hoc and driven by the goal of discrediting the Gospels. And third, I'll argue that at least one of those principles actually supports the case I presented for the nativity narratives of M and L. In conclusion, I will offer some final comments on the third step of Jonathan's argument. So let's begin with his first principle. According to Jonathan's first principle, the historical value of a relic trumps the value of a narrative where a relic is an artifact and a narrative is any written or spoken source. Jonathan then observes that the Gospels are narratives rather than relics, and thus that their reconstructions are not as reliable as a stock of relics would be. This principle is false for two reasons. The first reason is that there are clearly many instances where a narrative is more valuable than a relic for reconstructing past events. Imagine that Jones is murdered in his bathroom. 
The only clues we have to the crime is a single strand of Smith's hair found in Jones's bathroom and the testimony of Jones before he died that Fitzpatrick killed him. If Jonathan's first principle were correct, then the relic of Smith's hair would trump Jones's testimony, leading us to conclude that Smith, rather than Fitzpatrick, is Jones's murderer. But this is absurd, for Jones's testimony to Fitzpatrick's guilt is clearly of greater evidential value in determining who the murderer was than Smith's hair. This leads to the second problem. Relics must be interpreted. If we find Smith's hair in Jones's bathroom, we still have to ask what it is doing there. To be sure, texts must be interpreted as well, but the difficulty with interpreting the significance of a relic, like a hair, is far greater than the difficulty with interpreting a narrative, like a testimony. In his second principle, Jonathan points out that any historical source can be corrupted and that the apparent absence of corruption increases reliability. True enough. The problem, however, is that Jones treats, uh, Jonathan treats this as an all or nothing principle, as if we accept a document in its entirety or not at all. But this too is absurd. Instead, we weigh the value of the various claims in a document and place our greatest trust in the claims most well attested. That's what I've done with my focus on the three nativity claims that Jesus was born of a virgin, Mary, and to Joseph as well in approximately 4 BC in Bethlehem. In his third principle, Jonathan declares, quote, The closer a source is to the event which it purports to describe, the more one can trust it to give an accurate historical description of what actually happened, unquote. This general principle is also clearly false, as we can see by comparing two histories of World War II. W. L. Schreier's The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich, which was written in 1960, and Martin Gilbert's The Second World War, which was written in 2004. Despite the fact that Trier's book is more than four decades closer to the events it describes, I doubt there is a single historian who would think it a more reliable history than Gilbert's. If Jonathan's principle were correct, then one of our first steps in vetting historical reliability would be checking publication dates. But this would clearly be a spurious approach to the assessment of historical validity. Jonathan writes that the Gospels, quote, were written some nine decades after the events, unquote. I take it by events, he means the nativities of Matthew and Luke were written nine decades after the events they describe. That's possible, but it is also the very latest plausible dating for the texts. They could have been written much earlier, and as I noted, Richard Bauckham provides good reasons to think they were. In addition, the nativity narratives could be based on documentary evidence that is earlier still. And I also noted there is internal cultural and theological evidence within the narratives that would date them to well before A.D. 70. Jonathan concludes that the date of the Gospels, quote, obviously must have had some effect on their historical reliability, unquote. He's correct. However, Given that the hindsight of history can often work to the advantage of historical reliability, that effect may work in precisely the opposite way to what Jonathan supposes. In other words, the later history may be the more accurate one. In his fourth principle, Jonathan claims that eyewitness accounts are more reliable than secondary sources. I doubt Jonathan really observes this principle, however. No doubt, for example, Jonathan would trust a contemporary skeptic's debunking of the 1858 Lourdes miracles over eyewitness reports contemporaneous to the alleged events themselves. If Jonathan really followed his third and fourth principles, he'd reject the contemporary skeptics of Lourdes and side with the ancient contemporary testimonies of the events. By this point, it is becoming clear that not only are Jonathan's historiographical principles spurious, he himself is not even following them. I was delighted, however, to hear of Jonathan's sixth principle. Let me quote him again, 
quote, if a number of independent sources contain the same message, the credibility of the message is strongly increased, unquote. On this point, Jonathan is correct. And as I pointed out in my opening remarks, both M and L provide independent attestation to the three primary facts. Consequently, by Jonathan's own measure, the credibility of that core message for which I am arguing is strongly increased. Thank you, Jonathan. Jonathan complains that M and L do not cohere because each one includes some historical claims not recorded in the other. For instance, the Star of David in Matthew, the census of Quirinius in Luke. But this so-called problem is greatly overstated. As I already pointed out in my opening statement in reference to the two Lincoln biographies illustration, historical accounts of the same life can differ markedly in what they include and exclude without calling those documents into question. But what if the two accounts are contradictory at some points? Does this call the two accounts completely into question? Not at all. Consider a case where police are called to the scene of a man lying unconscious in the road. Two eyewitnesses offer contradictory accounts of the event that led him there. One reports a red Ford pickup hit the man. The second witness describes the vehicle as being an orange Chevy pickup. Do you think the police will dismiss both testimonies because of those contradictions? Of course not. Rather, they will apportion greatest assent to the details where the testimonies are in agreement. In this case, that an orangish red pickup hit the man, while remaining agnostic at all the points where the testimonies differ. Similarly, when we read two historical accounts of past events, that seem to contradict each other in places, we don't toss out both accounts. Rather, we place the greatest evidential weight on the points on which they agree, and that is precisely what I have sought to do. In his seventh principle, Jonathan declares that, quote, the source whose account can be confirmed by outside authorities in some of its parts can be trusted in its entirety, unquote. Unfortunately for Jonathan, this just isn't true. Just because a document is corroborated in some detail or other doesn't mean that every detail of the document is accurate. The fact that a jailhouse snitch on the witness stand gets one detail about the murder correct doesn't mean that his entire testimony is reliable. So why does Jonathan present his principle like this? If I may be blunt, it looks like he is formulating his historiographical principles with the precise intent of undermining the historical veracity of the nativity accounts. They seem to be formulated, in other words, in an ad hoc manner, simply to to discredit the Gospels. But that's not the way to do history. Jonathan's eighth principle is that, quote, The tendency of a source is its motivation for providing some kind of bias. Tendencies should be minimized or supplemented with opposite motivations. Jonathan's right about one thing. Everyone has a confirmation bias, and everyone has motivated reasoning in the assessment of evidence. And both these work together for the selectivity of evidence and of processing evidence. Consequently, we should be, we should strive to be aware of the confirmation bias and motivated reasoning in ourselves and others. But as it stands, Jonathan's eighth principle is completely spurious. For it would entail that when we read Jewish historian Raul Hilberg's book, The Destruction of the European Jews, we should account for Hilberg's Jewish bias, quote unquote, by reading a Holocaust denier's book the Holocaust denier representing the so-called, quote, opposite motivation, unquote. This is certainly absurd. Jonathan claims that the Gospels, quote, tend toward a massive bias that Jesus was the Messiah, unquote. In other words, the evangelists believed Jesus was the Messiah and wanted others to believe it as well. So what? As I pointed out in my opening statement 
every historian is motivated by certain belief commitments, economic, cultural, philosophical, and theological. And while those commitments can cloud a historian's judgment, they can also lead the historian to take his or her work with the utmost seriousness and care. In addition, we must remember that writing in the ancient world was no small thing, as it first required the acquisition of papyrus or vellum, that is, treated animal skin. Both of these were expensive and hard to come by. To put it simply, nobody in the ancient world sat down to write anything unless they had good reason. In his ninth and final principle, Jonathan notes, quote, If it can be demonstrated that the witness or source has no direct interest in creating or demonstrating bias, then the credibility of the message is increased, unquote. It should be little surprise that this final historiographical principle is spurious as well. Both Rawl Hilberg and Martin Gilbert are Holocaust historians. Can you imagine somebody saying they would sooner trust Gilbert's his Holocaust history over Hilberg's because Hilberg is Jewish and therefore must have a vested interest? It's not only a false principle, it's frankly an offensive one. To sum up, thus far we've seen that Jonathan presents nine historiographical principles, which are, for the most part, erroneous and appear to be formulated in an ad hoc manner precisely to the end of casting doubt on the gospel narrative accounts of the nativity. Not surprisingly, the one serious principle of the bunch is the multiple attestation principle that actually supports the three primary facts I've been seeking to defend. From here, Jonathan turns to his third point as he offers a direct critique of the gospel accounts. He begins with a quote from Richard Carrier, asserting that Luke is not among the first rank of historians of his day, because unlike the best historians, Luke doesn't quote his sources or articulate his methods in lengthy prolegomena. Of course, Luke does briefly discuss these matters in the opening of his gospel, chapter 1, verses 1 to 4, but presumably this isn't of sufficient length and detail to satisfy Carrier that Luke is a good historian. Well, interestingly, Luke's abbreviated prolegomena doesn't stop Sir William Ramsey from famously declaring that, quote, Luke is a historian of the first rank, unquote, and that Luke, quote, should be placed along with the very greatest of historians, unquote. The fact is that assessing the adequacy of one's history involves much more than assessing their prolegomena to that history. Ramsey is correct. Luke is an outstanding historian. The rest of Jonathan's comments are focused on secondary historical claims in the narratives that I am not concerned to defend, including the flight to Egypt, the genealogies, and the census of Quirinius. As I explained, whatever historical doubts about these details we may have, they do not thereby call into question the testimony on which Matthew and Luke find themselves in clear agreement, including the claim that Jesus was born of a virgin, Mary, and to Joseph in approximately 4 BC in Jerusalem and Bethlehem. Consequently, it is still reasonable for Christians to accept these three claims that are recorded in m and based on the witness of m and Thanks to Randall for that. So, let us look first at the claims that Randall has made before establishing more positive evidence from my own position. Randall looks to confirm historical reliability of the Gospels by claiming they, in an opening premise, are prima facie credible sources. I would like to take issue with Randall's attempts to frame the debate in his favour. He claims that historical reliability of the Gospels now only refers to three claims within the Gospels, a virgin birth, Joseph being legal parent and Mary biological parent of Jesus, and a Bethlehem birth. So what he has done here, of course, is pick the three claims of, the, of M&L that are unverifiable. All other claims, which have some degree of verifiability, he ignores because, one presumes, he knows he is on to a hiding to nothing with them. By holding to the reliability of claims which are, by their very nature, unverifiable, he is trying to protect himself from the ability to doubt them using other sources. There are simply no other contemporary attestations to who Jesus' parents were, where he was born, and whether it was virginal. 
These are personal facts that do not cross over with any other known fact. I, however, do not equate the historical reliability of the infancy narratives to those three points alone. He appeals to the following criteria to assert the reliability of these claims. Firstly, he asserts that it is reasonable to believe the claims because they are based on two independent prima facie reliable or credible sources unless one has good reason to reject them. And MNL are indeed independent and prima facie credible sources. The problem is we do not know whether they are independent. We do not know the sources. Randall appeals to Christian tradition to assert that the sources are separately Joseph and Mary, a claim for which there is zero evidence. It is Islamic tradition, after all, that many of the Hadith are reliable given what is called mutawatir, roughly equivalent to multiple attestation. And yet both Randall and I deny the reliability of the Hadith. Otherwise, we would be Muslims. Since we simply do not know the sources of M and L, we cannot know they are independent. Granted, they both have considerable differences, but the, those core three aspects that Randall retreats to could be from the same source. We simply don't know. As soon as we venture to any other claim, M and L are found utterly wanting. For example, M needs Herod in the story to chase Jesus to Je Egypt for several years so he can be the new Moses and come out of Egypt. You would think both Mary and Joseph would relay this to their respective interviewers, and both would include the king, no less, as being a cornerstone of the story. But let's look at the verifiability of this claim. At the time, Herod was in his 70s, acutely ill, and had even tried to commit suicide. He was not interested in the future of his kingdom, and only did atrocious acts for the here and now consequence. We know this. For a start, he left his kingdom in an utter state from which it never really recovered and was hence taken back over by the Romans. He didn't care who would rule it. So why would he worry about a prophecy which he had never previously heard of? Then he would chase people around, murder babies, all for a claim which would not come to fruition for at least another 20 years. And this is insane. Of course, he didn't. And there is no evidence to say that he did. The circumstantial evidence, on the other hand, makes the probability of the claim being true infinitesimally small. If these claims can be found to be patently ridiculous and in all probability false, and these are the ones that we can verify, what sort of epistemology allows one to special plea that the three unverifiable claims are somehow reliable? It beggars belief. Randall employs a false analogy to wave away the differences in talking about two biographies of Abraham Lincoln with their own slants on his life, one concentrating on one era of his life, the other on a different period. Of course, M and L are both concentrating on the same period, the infancy. So this is really a false analogy. And yet one gospel claims that Jesus returned straight away to Nazareth, whilst the other, that he was chased away by the baby-murdering king to Egypt for a few years, where he came out to fulfil a major prophecy. Did Luke think this was unimportant? Did his interviewee who experienced this really forget it? Or is it more likely that the accounts are simply unreliable and contradict each other? That is what both a prima facie and a second facie reading finds after all. Randall mentions Midrash, and it seems undeniable that particularly Matthew employs the technique of retelling the Old Testament stories in this renewed context. The Magi are Balaam from the Old Testament and the wise men uh, of Daniel, Herod both Balak and the Pharaoh, and Jesus as Moses coming out of Egypt, and so on. There seems a great desire to fulfil prophecy by hook or by crook. M and L need to get Joseph to Bethlehem for Jesus' prophetic birth. M, and M contradicts L in having them living there already. L uses a census, which happened at a time which verifiably contradicts M, and in a manner which is so ridiculous it simply cannot be true. The key ideas of the census of Luke are that... One, Joseph's ancestral home was Bethlehem because he was of the lineage of David. Two, males were requested to go to their ancestral homes to be registered. And three, Mary accompanied him. 
There are so many problems that arise out of this that we could have the whole debate on this one short passage. Joseph, as was claimed by El, was of the lineage of David, 41 generations past. At 41 generations backwards, virtually every single person in Israel could link themselves to David, in the same way that almost every American president can link themselves to King Charlemagne of France. This would mean that all of Israel, with the obvious status of being of the House of David, would be descending on Bethlehem. The other arbitrary factor is, why should it be 41 generations before which dictates the lineage of a census taker? Why not 40, 60, 32, 24? And then there is a notion that Anyone could actually know their family tree that far back. I mean, it's also ridiculous. Aside from these issues, we have the idea that any governing body would want to ask all their census takers to return to their ancestral homes. No other census in the history of the Roman Empire, nay, in the history of censuses, has required such a thing. What use would it be for people to return to an arbitrary ancestral home? Even at the very conservative migration rates, most of the male population would have to travel since very few would live in the same place as their ancestors within a 41 generation time frame. Remember, this was a Roman decreed census. This is certainly not pragmatic for them at all, and they were renowned for their pragmatism. They needed to know who lived where and what they owned so they could tax the regions accordingly. Galilee, where Joseph and family lived, was not in the same taxation area as Bethlehem. There was even less reason for him to go. All these males moving around, apparently taking their families too, why would this be a good idea for the governing bodies? To make matters worse, given that Joseph and betrothed would be away for around three weeks, for example, who would be working in this time? Who would be manning the fields, working in the inns, looking after the slaves, doing the fishing? This would be utter economic suicide, causing markets to implode and people to bankrupt themselves for the sake of a Roman census. Who would ever call this a good idea? There is not one existent good reason why this would happen. There is no precedent for this, and it is incoherent. And who would take their nine-month pregnant partner with them on an 80-mile journey to a census she is not required to attend? It's simply insane. The prior probability for the claim being true is very low indeed. So returning to the claim that M and L are prima facie reliable, Randall invokes Bolcom. In his book, on page 506, Bolcom states, the, quote, question is whether it is trustworthy, and this is open to tests of internal consistency and coherence, and consistency and coherence with whatever other relevant historical evidence we have and whatever else we know about the historical context. This, conce end quote. this concession seems to undermine the very claim that Bochum makes that the testimony should be taken on trust without the need to be independently verified. And following this, of course, the historical context and relevant evidence find M and L seriously wanting. Randall appeals to M and L's obscurity uh, in giving them credibility. I simply disagree here. We don't really know who they were and who their sources were and so on. We know next to nothing and yet Randall calls the sources credible. Accounting for the birth of God on earth is surely the most incredible claim and one that, in other religions, Randall dismisses. For that incredible claim, I would demand extraordinary evidence. And M and L, are they extraordinary evidence? I think not. There is even good reason to think that L's birth narrative is an interpolation, a later addition to the core gospel of Luke. Joseph Tyson, for example, theorises that its addition um, as an infancy narrative is a plan to undermine the gospel of Marcion. Luke 3 seems to be the natural start to the gospel anyway. There are differences in linguistic styles between the infancy narrative and the rest of Luke, ideology, treatment of characters, narrative tone, and so on. So this presents difficulties for the reliability of L here, and for the notion of multiple independent attestation. So we have seen that the notion that Jesus was born in Bethlehem as being credible and reliable, as Randall claims, is not correct. Both M and L contrive incoherently or contradictorily to get Joseph and family to Bethlehem. L has Joseph go to a census that is, as I've shown, nonsensical. M has a flat contradiction with L in having family living in Bethlehem anyway. Remember, there is nowhere in the rest of the Gospels that we have mention of Jesus in the context of Bethlehem. He is Jesus of Nazareth. 
In fact, the utter silence with regards to the whole of the infancy narratives in all of the Gospels after these initial accounts speak volumes as to their reliability. Jesus of Nazareth was more than likely born in or around Nazareth. It is staggering that there is no further mention or Pauline mention of such incredible claims as are found in M and L. Just to pick up another point um, that Randall made about the virgin birth and his rebuttal to the claim that uh, the virgin birth claims of m l arose out of a context of mythological miraculous births. Um, my point originally, of course, was to show that the uh, through some kind of Bayesian analysis that the prior probability of such a claim being true is incredibly low since there are a myriad of similar claims which uh, uh, everyone seems to these days believe uh, were false. So it would be some kind of special pleading to suddenly um, take m and as, as being true, uh, given the prior probabilities being very low. Um, so I'd like Randall to obviously deal with that. On the point of the resurrection which Randall brings up, I will not engage since we simply don't have the time. Suffice to say, I do not find the resurrection accounts reliable either. Jesus would have had a dishonourable burial, and all the evidence points to Joseph of Arimathea being a fictional mechanism, rather like most of the infancy characters themselves. In sum, Randall claims that M and L are credible and reliable, whilst only selecting as representing M and L three claims, which are by their very nature unverified and unverifiable. In fact, the only evidence he really points to in his source analysis is Christian tradition, which gets him nowhere. All other claims in the infancy narratives are entirely problematic, whether it be the Magi following a supernatural star uh, that no other astronomer in a very astute astronomical world sees uh, that somehow leads them across the world to a particular house, but which somehow also gets them lost to sidetrack to Jerusalem, a mechanism of M to get Herod into the story, or whether it be any other claim in M and L. Rather than follow the Magi on their short journey to Bethlehem, the baby-murdering king trusts them to return to him to portray the very person they travelled half the world to see, why did he simply not send an armed escort? Well, it wouldn't make a good story for a start. The Magi and the Shepherds, who had seen the most incredible sight of their lives, are strangely never heard from again. The Magi were important people in a perfect position to evangelise to the Gentile world. No, complete silence. Is this more likely under the thesis of factual reliability? or under the thesis of fictional unreliability. I'll let the listeners decide that. To conclude, history is a discipline of probabilities, not a punting to possibilities. We need to look at all of the evidence, both inside the Gospels and out, at the source analysis, at the level of the claims, and decide what is probable. We have possibly the most extraordinary claims known to man, written by unknown people in unknown places and times and with unknown sources using no historical methodology. The claims contradict each other regularly or contradict external sources. The disconfirmation of claims and the ignorance of source material and methodology should leave one in no doubt that the probability of these accounts being historically reliable is incredibly low and the probability of them being unreliable is incredibly high. In his rebuttal to my opening statement, Jonathan takes issue with my attempt to frame the debate in my favor. Apparently, he wishes I'd made things easier for him. Alas, if anything, I'm about to make his case more difficult. Jonathan misrepresents my position as being, quote, that the historical reliability of the Gospels now only refers to three claims within the Gospels. That's incorrect. I'm not conceding that the rest of m &L, still less the rest of Matthew and Luke, is historically unreliable. Instead, I'm simply focused on defending the most strongly evidenced claims in m &L, which relate to the virgin conception of Jesus to Mary and Joseph in Bethlehem. Jonathan complains that I've, quote, picked the three claims of m &L that are unverifiable, unquote, but that's false. As I pointed out, these claims are verified in two independent sources that were written a matter of decades after the events themselves. 
As I demonstrated, both texts provide theological and cultural cues that they predate the fall of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. That is excellent verification for any claim of ancient history. Jonathan is understandably anxious to challenge the fact that M and L represent independent sources, given that multiple attestation is such a strong indicator of historical reliability. But note the corner into which Jonathan has unwittingly painted himself. While he has labored to establish the many differences between M and L, note that the more differences he highlights, the stronger the case for M and L having different source origins. To put it simply, by arguing for the differences of the texts, Jonathan effectively makes my case that each provides independent attestation to the three facts I'm defending. Jonathan then insists that even though M and L are very different, they still might be reasonably considered to have a shared source of origin. Why? Because we don't know that they have independent origins. This is truly bizarre reasoning. It is equivalent to arguing that an Asian male and a Caucasian male walking down the street together are probably biological brothers because we don't know their parental origins. On the contrary, just as the ethnic differences of the two males make it unlikely that they have a common biological origin, so the literary differences of M and L make it unlikely that they have a common source origin. Jonathan then makes another desperate attempt to deny multiple attestation by appealing to Joseph Tyson's radical theory that both the Book of Acts and the Nativity of Luke date to around the year A.D. 125, with the Nativity being added to the Gospel as a sort of polemical rebuttal to the heretic Marcion. Tyson's thesis certainly is fanciful, though it suffers from many problems, including the lack of evidence for a Marcionite dispute in Tyson's allotted time frame. The fact is that apart from Tyson and a few other outliers, virtually all New Testament scholars date the entirety of the Gospel of Luke either to the early 60s or the 80s. I prefer a date of the early 60s, given that Acts is a sequel to Luke and Acts ends with Paul in prison. Since we know that Paul was martyred under Nero in the mid-60s, it is most plausible that Luke doesn't mention the martyrdom because Paul was still alive when Luke wrote Acts. That would place Acts in the early to mid-60s with the Gospel of Luke having been written shortly before that. In sum, appealing to Tyson for grounds to redate the nativity of Luke is akin to invoking a single climatologist to overturn the broad consensus on climate change. So, in addition to denying overwhelming evidence for multiple attestation when it doesn't suit his case, Jonathan also cherry-picks his scholars. This isn't the way to do history. Jonathan claims that the Lincoln biography analogy is illegitimate because the Lincoln biographies I cite focus on two different periods in the president's life. This is a pedantic response which misses the central point. Two historians can indeed provide very different descriptions of the same events owing to different perspectives, interests, and purposes. Next, Jonathan suggests that Richard Bauckham's claim that testimony is open to tests of coherence and consistency is inconsistent with his claim that you can accept testimony without independently verifying it. But there's no inconsistency here. The the principle of credulity does indeed allow one to accept a testimony as evidential value for a given claim, even as one can seek further corroboration for that testimony through tests of coherence and consistency. Jonathan seems to be suggesting that all historical claims should be independently verified. But this is an absurd demand, which immediately would set us off on an infinite regress, since every independent verification would itself have to be independently verified. The only way to break this absurd regress is precisely through the means Bauckham proposes, which involves a tentative assent corroborated with independent subsequent testing. Jonathan then asserts that any claim about the birth of God is incredible and thus would, quote, demand extraordinary evidence, unquote, all the more so given that there are many similar claims in the ancient world. But as I pointed out, Christians accept the virgin conception based on the unique life, teachings, historical impact, and resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. 
Surely evidence such as this grants claims about the miraculous birth of Jesus a prima facie credibility not pertaining to other ancient miracle claims. At this point, Jonathan simply declines to address the historical case for the resurrection. This is unfortunate, though hardly surprising, given the extremely powerful historical case that has been made in recent years by scholars like Michael Licona and N.T. Wright. Jonathan then closes by noting that history is a discipline of probabilities, not possibilities. Well, on that point, I couldn't agree more. And as I've shown, the probabilities in fact support the conclusion that MNL provide credible, independent early attestation to the virginal conception of Jesus to Mary and Joseph in Bethlehem in approximately 4 BC. Thanks, Randall. Now, it does seem that Randall has a few fundamental flaws in his approach. Firstly, his language and analogies show that he sees MNL as historians. Let me be quite clear, they are not historians in the context that we would understand it now, any more than the writers of the Hadith were, and he would reject their claims after all. Also, the claims of MNL are literally the greatest claims known to man, and so one would expect the greatest evidence to support such claims. Randall's thesis is full of coulds and maybes, could have as sources and could have been written earlier, etc., For every use of could, the final probability can be no higher, and will naturally be lower, than the probability of the could. For example, the later history may be the more reliable one. Now, if he uses in this thesis any use of the could, may or might, it infers a probability of less than 50%. Any multiple use compounds the probability calculations, such that a theory relying on a 25% could and a 40% maybe has a final probability of 0.25 times 0.4, or 0.1, or 10%, which would be very low indeed. As Randall's thesis was full of coulds and maybes and mites, his final probability for a reliable set of gospel accounts is very low. Another problem for Randall is that he is analogising the Gospels with historical writings which use historiographical techniques. The Gospels are not this and do not use this. With regards to multiple attestation, this is one of many criteria used to assess historical reliability and not the be-all and end-all. For a start, Randall has done nothing to prove that M&L are indeed independent. To repeat, where claims are verified, they are found to be either false or in all probability false, such as by using circumstantial evidence. This leaves only the three claims of Randall to represent the Gospels as being reliable. He claims they are independently attested, but provides no evidence, since there is none, that they are. There is no attestation from the earlier Paul, for example, of any claims other than he is of the seed of David, a nebulous claim at best. Basically, M and L, and the few verses in them, are the only evidence that Jesus was born of a virgin birth, had the parents he had, and was born in Bethlehem. Just those few verses. Again, the biography of Abraham Lincoln is referenced as well in his rebuttal, a false analogy as mentioned before. If one was to parallel the infancy narratives with the Lincoln biographies, it would be like one mentioning he was assassinated and the other not mentioning it at all. That is a level of difference between the Gospels, or in fact, not even that level. One has shepherds and a census, and the other three foreign dignitaries following the most amazing astronomical sign in the history of cosmology, and a baby-killing king of the country chasing the family away to a foreign country where they hide for several years, only to come out of that country and fulfil a prophecy which states that the protagonist is, in fact, the most important human being in the history of humanity. And yet, one of the Gospels doesn't include this? I'm sorry, these just aren't minor differences that can be cast aside because they are problematic. They they rank equally, if not more importantly, than who Jesus' parents were, where he was born, and whether his mother was a virgin. I think Randall has this seriously wrong. These claims disconfirm the reliability of the Gospels with consummate ease. I barely need to do the work here myself in showing this. I mean, the Gospels do the work for me. How can he explain the differences so that he can maintain a veneer of reliability? Well, he can't. However, he might appeal to because it's not mentioned, it doesn't mean it didn't happen, or 
Perhaps the writers had different agendas, and so on. But the scale and incredible nature of these claims destroy such attempted harmonisations. Again, Randall uses strained analogies to defend his position. The case of using two accounts which differ on the make and colour of a car admits that at least one of the accounts is unreliable in some of the claims it makes. Thanks, Randall. Though he might call the differences insignificant, a subjective assertion at most at any rate, it is a clear admission that at least one of the Gospel accounts is, indeed, unreliable. The problem is the areas which Randall seems to admit difficulty are the areas that support at least one of his core claims. Certainly the birth being in Bethlehem. Since either Joseph did not already live there, or he did not travel to a nonsensical census, then at least one is wrong, and more probably both, are merely mechanisms of the author to contrive Jesus being born in Bethlehem. And yet this is one of the three core points Randall is attempting to defend, and that core point is supported in either gospel by two completely separate claims. Randall attempts to discredit the criteria as being aimed at discrediting the Gospels in an ad hoc manner, those nine core principles that I brought up in the opening statement. However, they are accepted principles, albeit with limitations as, as any principle is, which are fairly, fairly commonsensical. For example, if we find a document counting 12 points in a, in a year in Caesar's life that we know little about, and we know that four of those points are verifiably true, then we can have better reason to believe the whole document is true, rather than if no points at all were verified out of the 12. I mean, this is obvious, and yet this is one of the points that Randall contests. And yet no claims of the Gospel are verified at all, other than Herod lived roughly around that time, and that the census happened roughly around that time. But the claims m and make are, about them both are clearly problematic. Therefore, the accounts as a whole are seriously called into question. I will leave you with one more example of how the Gospels seem to have stolen aspects of actual events and attributed them to Jesus, and one which is little known to many apologists. In 66 CE, Halley's Comet appeared in the sky. As a result, a group of Magi, led by King Tiridates of Armenia, um, came to pay homage to Emperor Nero. After visiting him, they returned by a different passage. Sound familiar? Matthew wrote his own version a few short years later of Magi following a star to pay homage to their great leader. In his second rebuttal, Jonathan says that I view M and L as historians. That's incorrect. M and L are nativity accounts. The historians are the authors of the Gospels, Matthew and Luke, which I have argued can be reasonably believed to be Matthew and Luke, since these are first century documents, and nobody writing a pseudopigraphic work would attribute it to a relatively obscure individual like Matthew or Luke, when authoritative names like Peter and James were available. Jonathan says the claims of m l are, quote, literally the greatest claims known to man, unquote, and so one would expect, quote, the greatest evidence to support such claims, unquote. When he says greatest claim, Jonathan seems to mean most implausible claim. Well, the claim I present is based on the multiple attestation of documentary evidence compiled a matter of decades after the purported events and attributed to an individual who by any measure lived an extraordinary life and for whom there is good evidence of a miraculous resurrection. If Jonathan wants to talk about incredibly implausible claims, well, I hear them every day. Consider, for example, the claim that DNA arose through undirected processes, or that the universe sprung into existence uncaused, out of nothing. And yet atheists regularly make claims like this with a straight face, based on little more than a holy reverence for chance plus time. Jonathan refers disparagingly to qualifications like could, how ironic, since Jonathan is the one who suggests that m &L could derive from the same source, and that the nativity of Luke could be a 2nd century addition to the Gospel, despite all the evidence to the contrary. Jonathan flatly denies that the Gospels are serious history. Unfortunately, like those plaid pants in your father's closet, such declarations have fallen out of fashion in the academic world. <laughs> 
In addition to Bauckham's Jesus and the Eyewitnesses, I would recommend Richard Burridge's scholarly monograph, What are the Gospels? where Burridge demonstrates how the Gospels conform to the rigorous standards of Greco-Roman biography. Jonathan says I've done nothing to show M and L are independent. Well, I didn't have to. Jonathan did that work for me by presenting all the contrasts between the two accounts. And he continues to do just that in his latest rebuttal. Once again, we have Jonathan's could qualification being swept away by the cascade of evidence he himself presents. Jonathan again reiterates that m and provide the only evidence for the three claims I'm defending. Correct. Two independent, credible sources written within decades of the events. In ancient history, that's a gold standard. Jonathan doesn't even try to defend his nine historiographical principles beyond claiming that I deny that when a document is corroborated in some of its details by external evidence, that this increases the overall perception of the document's reliability. But I never disputed that claim because that was not one of Jonathan's principles. His actual seventh principle made the very different claim that a source that has its account in part confirmed by external authorities can be trusted in its entirety. That is clearly an erroneous principle, as I explained with the jailhouse snitch illustration. So ultimately, Jonathan's only defense of his principles is to introduce a new principle that was not part of the original nine. In the world of retail, we call that the old bait and switch. Well, I'm not buying. Jonathan's final comment is a surprising concession that Matthew's nativity account was written a few short years after A.D. 66. That could place the document even prior to the fall of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. So now it sounds like Jonathan dates Matthew earlier than many New Testament scholars do. As with the case of the independent source origin of m and I didn't need Jonathan's help to make my case here, but I appreciate it nonetheless. So, to sum up, Jonathan's case against the nativity accounts consists of two parts, his nine principles and the contrasts between M and L. But now he's all but abandoned his nine principles, even as he continues to marshal evidence that m and have independent source uh, origins, evidence that constitutes multiple attestation to the primary claims I'm defending, that Jesus was virginally conceived, born to Mary and Joseph in Bethlehem in approximately 4 BC. Thanks, Randall. However, I would like to clear a few issues up. Firstly, a few short years was a relative term with regards to the last 2,000 years, and meant 20-odd years. I thought this would have been fairly obvious by my claim that M and L were written nine decades after the birth of Jesus that I made in the opening statement. It is more telling that he ignored the actual point here, instead preferring to try to misinterpret my use of the term a few short years. I'd like him to answer the substantive point that I made um, about Tiridates and Halley's Comet. Secondly, when Randall referred to one of my claims being misinterpreted, it was actually by him since it originally stated, quote, the source whose account can be confirmed by reference to outside authorities in some of its parts can be trusted in its entirety if it is impossible similarly to confirm the entire text, end quote. Randall did not give any corroboration from outside sources. He simply ignored this point. I've not abandoned any principles. It is just impossible to cover everything in the allotted time. I would love to go on for hours and perhaps we can extend this debate in written form. It needs to be noted that Randall has done absolutely nothing to refute any of the points I've made with regards to contradictions and incoherencies, retreating solely to his main three points, and the point of Bethlehem is seriously questioned anyway. Of course, this was not the subject of the debate, although he has tried to frame it so, since there are a lot more claims than those three in the Gospels. Randall has chosen those three points and refuses to deal with any other. This is simply not good enough. That is like debating the reliability of two entire biographies of Abraham Lincoln, but only being willing willing to discuss his assassination and nothing else in his reported life. Randall has summarily failed to deal with the census, Quirinius, Herod's nonsensical actions, the insanity of Luke not mentioning a baby-killing king chasing the family away to a foreign country for two years only to seemingly fulfil an immense prophecy, and pretty much every other point on the incoherencies of the accounts. 
Finally, let me look at multiple attestation and Luke. He has it seriously wrong about calling Luke and Matthew historians. That is just plainly incorrect. They are agenda-laden evangelists. Heck, he ain't called Luke the evangelist for nothing. He seems to think that Luke is held in reverence as a historian. This is only by apologists. Carrier does a great job in carefully showing Luke's failings in Not the Impossible Faith. Randall failed to deal with one such quote that I made from him earlier. Such is the lack of methodology and the lack of verifiability used by Luke that it beggars belief. Improving history, Carrier says this. Quote, when does multiple attestation argue for historicity? Only when the fact of multiple attestation entails the probability our explanation is true is substantially higher than how expected the evidence is if our explanation isn't true, which only occurs when we can establish to some degree of probability that two extant testimonies to the same claim derive, at least ultimately if not directly, from independent eyewitnesses of the fact attested, or from one eyewitness or group of eyewitnesses whose reliability on that claim is demonstrably more likely than their lying or being in error. But rarely can we ascertain even who an author's source is, much less to which eyewitness it can ultimately be traced, and we can rarely assert someone is reliable when we don't even know who they are even when we do not even when we do know it would be naive to merely presume their reliability and establishing it is often impossible which is why hearsay is almost never even admitted as evidence in a court of law and why modern historians of antiquity are often skeptical of all but the most public or mundane of claimed facts end quote carrier also states that stories can be fag fabricated long before our written sources and probably long before even their written sources uh, were around spawning numerous independent lines of legendary development which each came to be independently recorded later on thus multiple attestation does not establish its historicity a similar datum can also originate independently because of a common motive rather than a common source to explain a shared problem in the text or to defend a shared doctrine or goal. Now that's taken from Carrier, uh, page 173 to 175, Proving History. Um, but the important point here is that if we don't know the sources uh, and we're only guessing at certain aspects of these sources, then the highest the probability can be of any kind of claim that we make about them is 50%. So the h highest probability that that, um, that Randall can come up with for the claims being reliable, for the, the Gospels being reliable, is 50%. And that, to me, is not reliable. I'd like to uh, begin my closing statements by thanking Jonathan again for a very engaging, informative, and, dare I say it, fun debate. But enough niceties. Now on down to business. In his final rebuttal, Jonathan tries once more to marginalize the shared witness of M&L by claiming that multiple attestation could be explained by common motive. True, it could... Although I seem to remember Jonathan saying could wasn't good enough. Our focus should instead be on what is most plausible. Ironically, at this point, we see Jonathan effectively abandoning his sixth historical principle, which linked the vertical value of historical claims to their attestation in multiple independent sources. Let me be blunt. Jonathan's so-called historical principles seem to be crafted ad hoc for the singular purpose of discrediting M and L. This is history driven by ideology. In contrast, I demonstrated that M and L are independent sources which both witness to the virginal conception of Jesus to Mary and Joseph in Bethlehem in approximately 4 BC. I have shown that these two independent accounts are early and plausibly based on eyewitness testimony compiled by Matthew and Luke. And since multiply attested, their historical witness is secure, despite whatever questions we may have about the historical or midrashic pretensions of the other claims in M and L. Finally, I've observed that any assessment of the virginal conception of Jesus recorded in M and L must be made in light of the evidence for the unique life, teachings, and miraculous resurrection of Jesus. For the plausibility of the unique conception of Jesus is greatly increased in light of the other facts about his life.
In conclusion, when all the evidence is brought to bear and ideology is set aside, a person can indeed conclude on sober historical grounds rooted in the witness of MNL that a miracle occurred that first Christmas day. I would like to thank Randall and the organisers for a stimulating and enjoyable debate which deserves to continue for at least another few hours, since I do actually contest, unsurprisingly, everything that Randall has said. Randall has failed to deal with any of the substantive points I've made during this debate, continuing to cherry-pick his way through M&L to find points which are unverifiable. Since every other claim in M&L fails the test of reliability, as does his third point about Bethlehem, which he has failed to address, then what epistemic right does he have to assert the other two claims are reliable? He has literally a couple of lines of an ancient document with unknown provenance to reliably claim a miracle of extraordinary importance and unlikelihood took place. What other such claim outside of the Bible would he afford such charity? This appears to be double standards. I cannot see how he can establish anywhere beyond a 50% probability that M&L are independently attested. Even if they are, this does not ensure reliability, otherwise Randall would find the Islamic Hadith reliable, another point which he failed to address. The prevailing theory is that M&L used a common source, Q, but theories such as Mark Goodacres are growing in popularity, concluding that Matthew embellished Mark and that Luke knew Matthew. Both options completely undermine Randall's position, and these are attested to by Christian scholars. In my book, The Nativity, A Critical Examination, I conclude similarly to Raymond Brown, the eminent Catholic scholar, that M&L are unreliable, historically. The difference being that I dispute theological truth, since there is no historical truth to hang it upon. I finish with some 30 points which the Christian has to contrive to make sense before they can start to label M&L as reliable. Randall has overcome none of the few of those 30 that I have mentioned. In this way, Randall has failed to show that the probability for Matthew and Luke's claims in the whole of their infancy narratives being true is high. That probability, it appears, is exceptionally low. To catch up on past Reasonable Doubts episodes or to email your questions or comments, check out www.doubtcast.org. Reasonable Doubts is a production of WPRR Reality Radio. You can find out more about Reality Radio at publicrealityradio.org. Reasonable Doubts theme music is performed by Love Fossil and used with permission.